I'd like to welcome you to our annual T. Anthony Polner Lecture. I'm Carol Van Valkenburg, Professor Emerita in the school, and are we ever glad to see you here tonight. We come together tonight physically rather than remotely for the first time in two years to celebrate the legacy of a bright, talented, and memorably irreverent young man, Anthony Polner. This year marks 20 years since his family's sudden loss. I know they think often, still after all these years, what might have been. Where would his talents have taken him? Who would he have shared his life with? What children might he have had to love as intensely as his parents, Ben and Alice, and siblings, Amy and Edward, loved him? These yearly convocations are, in many ways, joyful because we get to remember how funny, how sometimes outrageous, and how always bold Anthony Polner was. Yet I know over all these years, the fall lectures were a wistful occasion for Alice and Ben especially. As grateful as they were for the chance to let us speak again about their beautiful boy, as Alice often says, it is bittersweet. The sting of grief is not as sharp as it was in May 2001, but the pain never lies too far from the surface. But what the family has given us at the School of Journalism is a gift beyond measure. They helped us build a new home for the school, which houses the technology that Anthony embraced far earlier than almost any other person, student, or faculty member. But their most important gift is this. These world-class journalists who come for four months and share their lives and lessons. This fall marks the 28th semester of a Polner professor in residence. Many have been Pul Pulitzer Prize recipients, National Magazine Award winners, Newspaper Photographers of the Year, and have earned many, many other significant forms of recognition. Our speaker this evening continues that long tradition of excellence She's been an editor at the Hartford Current, the Philadelphia Inquirer, the Baltimore Sun, the Atlanta Journal Constitution, and most recently at CNN Digital, where she led a team of enterprise reporters and was an editor in the investigations unit. Jan Winburn is an editor's editor. You might hear some journalists, if you've ever spent any time in a newsroom anyway, grouse about what an editor did to their work. And there are inept editors, to be sure, but editors like Jan not only make work better, but people better. They enhance and sometimes save careers. People who have worked with Jan gush with a string of, of superlatives so long that an editor as discerning as Jan would suggest maybe toning it down a bit. She was one of the most respected people at CNN one colleague said, people would fall all over themselves to work with her. One part of my job was saying, no, you can't work with Jan because everybody wanted to. No one else comes close to the loyalty people feel toward her. We had, she said, a range of people, high maintenance, pains in the ass, some not as good as they thought they were, but Jan could work with every type of person. Writers called it going through Jan school. Another colleague said, she is hands down the best editor, mentor, and newsroom leader I have ever encountered. He called her open, curious, and highly engaged. I've spent the rest of my career looking for a boss like Jan, he said. Luckily, we at the School of Journalism have found her. And for the next several months, Thanks to the generosity of the Thorpe and Polner families, the students at the Montana Kyming and those in her Polner seminar are fortunate enough to soak up all those lessons she's learned and, and taught, excuse me, in some of the na nation's best newsrooms. Ladies and gentlemen, Jan Winburn. everybody hear me? I think so. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, and I want to thank Anthony's family. Um, they were not able to be here, but 
I want to thank them for making it possible for me to be here. And uh, I want to say that already, with the students and the faculty that I've had the pleasure to be around these pa this past month, it is already really one of the most pleasurable times of my life. So thank you all for being who you are. So I am interested in the emotional landscape of trauma and tragedy. It's the subject of the seminar I'm teaching here. It's called The Worst Day Ever, How to Write About Trauma. So what we're learning is about how to cover somebody's worst day ever. I want to start um, by telling you about my passion for this topic and the story of my family's worst day ever. Two years after I graduated from journalism school, my older brother, Jim, was killed in an airplane crash. He was 26 and the navigator in an Air Force, Air Force fighter jet that went down in a snowstorm in Utah. It was a mountainous area. It was December, and because of the weather conditions, it was difficult for a team to get to the site. My family held tight to the hope that Jim had ejected safely from the jet. We waited two days to learn that he was gone and two more for the recovery team to bring him home off the mountain. After the news that he had died came out, the phone rang in my folks' house in Kansas City, and I picked it up. On the other end was a reporter from the Kansas City Star. For the first time in my short journalism career, I was on the end of answering painful questions rather than asking them. The reporter was kind and he expressed condolences. He wanted to know more about my brother and he wanted to know things about the crash that the Air Force would not tell him. Was the weather the cause of the crash, he asked me, or had my brother or the pilot made some kind of fatal error? I understood what he was doing. He was in pursuit of a story like so many, a headline that marked an ending. It was the ending of a search, the end of my brother's life, and the end of our hope. But sometime after that day and the years that followed, I began to understand personally and as a journalist that every headline that marked an ending, a new beginning was about to unfold. And those were the stories I became interested in telling. A farmer dies one Christmas when his house burns to the ground. What will his wife and kids do? Sell the farm, move into town, or plant the fields when spring comes? A man buries his son killed in a rock. How does the man go on? What becomes of a father's grief? A young woman, woman driven to succeed buckles under the pressure and tries to take her life. 25 years later, what has living taught someone who once thought that death was a solution? These were all stories I assigned early in my career. They were stories with tragic endings. They made the headlines, but they marked new beginnings. And those stories opened into tales of triumph and strength and resilience. Now fast forward 40 years, my career in journalism has spanned much of the profession's modern history, from news stories typed out on typewriters and thrown onto your porch step to a deafening, seemingly inescapable 24-7 news cycle. One that assaults us on all fronts, online, on air, and in print. I spent the last 10 years, as Carol said, at CNN Digital. It's the number one destination for online news in the world. It often felt like a 24-7 job. I worked as an editor dispatching writers across the globe to places where terrible things had happened the Boston Marathon bombing, the war in Iraq, 
the hurricane in Haiti, the earthquake in Nepal, the mass shooting in Newtown, in Las Vegas, Orlando, Parkland, it goes on. The reporters on my team were not the first responders bringing you the headlines. They were in pursuit of the aftermath stories, the stories that introduced you to the human beings who suffered and survived, and not just the catastrophic events. Sometimes they would revisit these people again and again. Like the three-month-old Iraqi girl whose disfiguring birth defect guaranteed the end of her life. Soldiers patrolling the Abu Ghraib neighborhood at the height of the Iraq War discovered her and shuttled her to America for life-saving surgery. She became known as Baby Noor, Iraq's miracle baby. The reporter, Moni Basu, would return to Iraq many times to chronicle Noor's journey. The last time, Noor was 11 years old. Another writer dispatched to the Pulse nightclub in Orlando told the quiet story of a man who knew 17 of the gunman's victims. 17. He was six foot nine and built like a redwood, John Sutter wrote. Everyone called him Tree. Sutter's story amid a calamitous event in which people were targeted because they were different, focused instead on acceptance. Tree was a straight man who had met his friends by virtue of a job he had at another gay bar. They'd accepted him for exactly who he was when others had not. Sutter wrote, they saw past the nose ring and the size 19 shoes. They didn't tease him about his weight or his height, didn't make him feel like a freak or an ogre. They knew what it was like to be judged unfairly. Let me be clear. These stories did not deny or erase the suffering, but telling them seemed to us as important as bringing you the news. They gave a fuller, more balanced account of human trauma and recovery. They conveyed complexity and subtlety. They weren't just informational, they were experiential. They touched the heart as well as the head. This past year, I stepped away from the newsroom altogether to focus on teaching and editing books. And for the first time, I consumed the news a little bit more like a citizen than a journalist. I watched the video of George Floyd's death. I followed flabbergasted the January 6th assault on the Capitol. I came to see the pandemic for what it was and is, a mass traumatic event with losses that span the spectrum, lost jobs, lost loved ones, lost dreams, isolation, loneliness. So rest assured, I understand the impulse to escape the barrage of bad news, to turn off the TV, to shut down the social media feeds, and to try to go about life a little more blissfully, even if ignorant. I was not surprised to learn that the word doom scrolling was added to the Oxford American Dictionary in 2020, a year that we binged watched the world in crisis. Today, I want to share with you some of the research I found while preparing to teach students about trauma journalism, trauma-informed journalism. What does it mean? It means understanding what goes on in a survivor's brain when the unthinkable happens and adjusting how you behave toward them with that knowledge. It means learning how to do justice to a survivor's story without doing harm. And I want to argue against rubbernecking, of glancing and then moving on. I want to argue on behalf of pulling over 
and looking deeply. It's indeed painful to, to embrace the magnitude of loss uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, wrecked by, that, by the pandemic. It's numbing to know that in 2021, we've already averaged almost two mass shootings a day. And it's gutting to see one suffer what I call everyday traumas, car wrecks, cancer, the inevitable losses that mark a human lifetime. But here's the deal. Research shows that traumatic, the traumatic and the tragic are avenues to connection and compassion. And what do we need more in this polarized world? So who here has been touched by trauma? If it hasn't found you already, it will. Trauma tracks you down. Studies estimate that 40 to 80% of the population has experienced a traumatic event. Exposure is so extensive that the author and psychiatrist Sandra Bloom calls trauma a central organizing principle in the formation, development, and maintenance of human society. In other words, trauma is central to human existence. It's also central to journalism. <clears throat> it is, after all, the journalist's job to inform, to report on what is happening in the world, to give voice to citizens. And sometimes that means illuminating this landscape landscape of tragedy and trauma. I confess journalism has not always done this well, and it still struggles and sometimes fails. But there has been a movement in the profession to make news coverage on tragedy and loss and the way it is reported better and more humane. Some changes have only come at the insistence of people who are caught up in the coverage. How often should a story or a TV news anchor repeat a gunman's name? How long do you air or publish a perpetrator's photo? Do you lead the website with the murderer's face or the faces of the victims? These were questions raised by a couple whose son was killed while shielding his girlfriend with his body in the Aurora, Colorado mass shooting. Their campaign was called No Notoriety, and it was bolstered by research showing that the there is the existence of a copycat effect in mass shootings. And because of that, most news organizations decided to limit the use of a shooter's name and image. Chris Vanderveen is the director of reporting at Nine News in Denver. As a young reporter, he covered the Columbine shooting in 1999. In 2012, he reported on the Aurora shooting. And in March of this year, March 22nd, he led a team of reporters when a gunman killed 10 people in a supermarket in Boulder. Chris told me that his newsroom was transformed by Aurora. They invited family members of victims to come into the news station to talk, not for a story, but so the reporters and editors could listen. We wanted to know what could we do differently, Chris told me. What could we learn as journalists about not adding to the grief? Journalists and educators, doctors and psychologists have been studying this intersection of news reporting and violence since about the mid-1990s. Guarded, I'm sorry, guided by the DART Center for Journalism and Trauma, the profession has shifted focus from the disaster to the aftermath, from the perpetrator to the victims and survivors and first responders. Frank Ochberg, a psychiatrist and co-founder of the DART Center and a pioneer in treating post-traumatic stress, calls this act to journalism. It goes beyond the tragedy, which is act one, and includes the stages of recovery. 
Act two journalism often features hope, patience, and resilience. And it is often the product of what I call slow journalism, in which a reporter can give survivors the time to process what has happened to them and perhaps make some sense of it. Sometimes the story can be told within days of a tragedy. More often it takes weeks, months, or years. This type of storytelling has its own effect on readers, listeners, and viewers. Research has shown that the more information the brain absorbs about a person, the more empathy grows for that person. In other words, deeply told narrative stories, stories that put you in someone's shoes, can spark feelings of empathy. They have the power to influence minds and motivate actions. Grief experts say connection itself is healing. But what about when the crises begin to pile up? Wildfires, wars, hurricanes, collapsing buildings, a train derailment. All recent events all occurring during our drawn out disaster, the pandemic. Is there a limit to our empathy? We do not yet know what effect a sustained trauma like the pandemic will have on our ability to be empathetic toward others. This is because most research has focused on a singular disaster with a beginning and an end. In those, adults and even children as young as nine have been found to become more generous after a disaster. But Arthur Brooks, the Harvard professor and social scientist, says we can learn from the pain of the pandemic and other disasters. He points to a phenomenon known as post-traumatic growth. We've all known somebody who's gone through some terrible trial and yet says, that was the worst time in my life and it was the best time in my life. They've survived a devastating trauma, but they report feeling transformed, changed in some positive way. They may have a newfound sense of strength. Uh, a deeper appreciation for life. They care more about relationships. They do better the next time they experience loss. Psychologists say this post-traumatic growth is not the same as resilience. Resilience is the ability to bounce back. Some people do this, they move on. Others find their core beliefs challenged, their world rocked. And in response, they may struggle psychologically. They may experience mental illness, depression, post-traumatic stress. But ultimately, they find personal growth. It's a process that takes time. But here's the good news. Psychologists estimate that one half to two thirds of people who suffer trauma do experience post-traumatic growth. Dark and distressing news then can be an invitation to grow, to change, to become better people. And what can we learn from those who suffer, from their growth if and when it comes? By not tuning out, by not looking away, by listening to stories of loss and tragedy, we have a chance as Elizabeth Kubler-Ross says, to become nothing short of beautiful. So I'm urging you to curate your news, to look for these aftermath stories. Students who graduated from this university, people who teach here or have taught here, and students learning the ropes today, they tell these stories, or they will, because these are the stories that matter. I want to leave you with my family's aftermath story. It too starts with a surprising phone call, almost exactly 30 years after the day my brother Jim died. On the telephone line this time was one of my brother's Air Force friends, Terry Adams. And this was the news he shared. He was retiring and moving away from Hill Air Force Base in northern Utah. 
two days before his departure, he'd gone to the barber shop on base and picked up a copy of the newspaper, the Hilltop Times. On the front page were photographs and a story about an Air Force team of 72 who, at the request of the Goshute Indians, had cleaned up the crash site of an F-4 Phantom Jet on their land on the Utah-Nevada border. The team had scaled a 12,000-foot mountain in the Deep Creek Range known as Haystack. They'd spent four nights and three days removing debris that rained down both sides of the peak, covering 56 acres. Pieces of wreckage filled 17 crates and weighed two and a half tons. The jet's tail hook was recovered. So too was a pencil and a military issued watch with a serial number on it. It turned out to be my brother Jim's. News of the cleanup and the photos lifted us. We knew where Jim had died, but we had never seen pictures of the place. We were stunned by its rugged beauty. We looked at the faces of the Air Force crew gathered around their base camp. We studied pieces of wreckage, large and small. We stared at the golden mountaintop where Jim's life ended, and we resolved to go there. In October 2009, almost two years later, my mother and father and my brother Jack and I arrived in the Ipapaw Valley in Nevada on the land of the Goshute Federated Tribes. Ed Navarajo, the tribal administrator who my father had contacted, greeted us. He and three other men would escort us up the mountain. My brother Jack carried a GPS and the coordinates of the exact location of the crash. In a backpack, we had a thin granite marker inscribed with the dates of Jim's birth and death. We piled into the tribe's Humvees and pointed toward the Deep Creek Range. As we passed the powwow grounds, the youngest of the men told us his father was tending sheep when he witnessed the crash, and that he himself had led the Air Force cleanup team to the site. Our vehicles kicked up dust and we wound our way toward the mountain. Finally, we came to a stop. Jack jumped out, peered at his GPS, and shook his head. No, this wasn't it. We needed to keep going. Around the mountain we traveled, climbing in elevation, and making a few more false stops until our destination came into view. It turned out we didn't need the GPS. We could see the crash site. 32 years had not erased the scar from the mountain. We continued on foot, bushwhacking through the scrub until Jack, staring at his GPS, told us, this is it. As Jack and I scouted a place for our marker, we looked down at the ground for the first time. Scattered everywhere were small fragments of the airplane. We filled our pockets with them. We put the marker on a small outcrop in the scar that overlooked the mountains below. We used our hands to dig out the dirt to secure it. Then we fell silent, each of us lost in thought. I felt comforted that my brother had come to a rest in such a beautiful place where eagles fly. The next morning at breakfast in the hotel, my mother recalled being awakened in the middle of the night on December 3rd, 1977. My father was traveling and she was home alone when the two Air Force officers knocked on the door. My dad listened quietly. He'd always regretted not being there with my mother in that awful moment. But soon, he was caught up in his own reverie. He replayed for us every moment of our journey from Georgia to Utah and Nevada to the Goshute Reservation to the peak known as Haystack Mountain. It was, he told us, one of the best days ever. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm happy to take 
questions, and I think we have a couple of different mics to, to be able to do that. Anybody? Hello. Hi. Uh, I'm Rob Cheney. I'm one of the reporters at the Missoulian newspaper, and I'd like to, on behalf of my colleagues, welcome you to Missoula and okay. extend an invitation to talk more about this with uh, our newsroom at some point. Sure. I'd love to do that. It'd be great. In covering traumatic events, you've got a, a bunch of different forces working at the same time. You've got a, a ticking deadline clock. You've got a bunch of sources of information from the, from the people who were on the scene who may be posting on Facebook and social media that you may or may not feel comfortable or have any way to verify. And you've got law enforcement, which is the, the news world's typical first source and, and most authoritative source. But in the last few years in particular, we've found that law enforcement has frequently had an agenda that worked very against the uh, accurate depiction of facts. Um, I'm thinking in particular of uh, some of the Black Lives Matter incidents mm -hmm. that uh, have gone to court and, and been proven to have a totally different actual uh, result than what law enforcement initially provided. And I don't want to be accusatory in any direction. I want to ask more, what is your best practices now for covering a traumatic breaking event when it seems that virtually all of your information sources are suspect and time sensitive? Now, there's a simple question to start with. <laughs> um, so I think some of the um, news organizations that, that I respect have, have begun doing something um, where they frame their stories just saying, this is what we know now. And then they list point by point only the facts that they are able to corroborate with two sources. This often means that you have a list that's longer than what you're able to print of things you might know or someone said but you don't have them nailed down. And I think it's a very good way to approach this. I, one, I think it, it holds you accountable yourself. I'm not going to write anything. I don't know two ways. But also, I think it, it's, a, it's very transparent with your reader or your viewer because you're, you're just saying, this is what we know now. It's, it's the opposite of, of the talking heads, right, that you see on air who are just, you know, like filling up the time with like what ifs and maybe this and maybe that and, you know, conjecture. <clears throat> so that's a very simple answer to your very complex <laughs> question. Um, it's also, as you point out about um, Black Lives Matter and, and some of the police shootings that we've been dealing with, you know, it just underscores the need to get documentary evidence of anything and everything you're told by police. And I've noticed, even uh, the short time I've been here in Missoula, that there have been some police shootings for which they will not release the dash cam video. And yet, I saw quoted, probably in your paper, uh, or actually may have been in the Kyman, that um, uh, some authorities, uh, a, an ADA or an assisted dis district attorney or someone like that was basically saying he disagrees with that law, but he can't change it, and sort of giving a prescription to the public for what to do. He says, I think a judge would listen to an appeal for that, for that footage. Um, so it, it's not just requesting it and then saying, oh, the law blocks it. It's, it's really, it's, it's, it's going further than that. It's sort of, you know, and here's a guy who's pretty much telling the public, including all these journalists, that uh, 
that can that could be appealed. That could be that could be taken to a judge. Why uh, why should we just accept this that in this case? Also, the families in, in those instances are are asking for that footage, and um, I think if the families succeed, a reporter needs to be there and see it. And the argument to the authorities is, you don't want me just reporting what the family says about the tape. I need to see it as well. So it's, it's, it's doubling down on all of the, the ethics that we have in place and have had for a very long time. Um, it's, it's just much more fraught, for sure, than it's ever been. Hi, Jen. Hi. Kevin Van Valkenburg, class of 2000. Um, let's say I'm a young reporter at the Missoulian or the Cayman or the Great Falls Tribune or a paper that needs me to do a lot of things uh, as a young reporter, maybe write a couple stories a day, certainly five stories a week. How do I convince my editor that I need to spend six to eight, 12, 25 weeks on a story uh, when they might not have this kind of experience with editing long pieces, understanding why long pieces are valuable to their publication. We have a lot of students here, I think, who are going to go out into the world soon. How do they tell the people that they're about to work for that this has value? And what do they, how do they start that conversation with someone? Uh, didn't I see you do that at, in your first job at the Baltimore Sun? I could tell them how I taught, asked you about how I could do it, but <laughs> I would like you to uh, share your perspective on how non-Kevin Van Valkenburg reporters uh, have this conversation. Um, so, <clears throat> one of the things I always tell reporters is that you have to educate up, right? In every job, I mean, we always, we all do. We have to educate up. So how do you educate that editor that, that's what Kevin's asking, how do you educate them that, that this, is, this is worth the time, this is worth the investment? Um, I think, first of all, as a young reporter, you have to be willing to do it on your own time, okay? You're not gonna get given all the time you need to get that story. But if you invest some of your own time and you start to make headway, then you've got something to, to use to say, look what I have. This is where I could go. Give me, can you give me a little more time? Um, but the other thing I think is really great to do is find stories that you aspire to. So find the kind of story that, that you're thinking this could be, and, and give it to your editor and say, I really like this story. This is the kind of thing I'd like to do. Would you read it? I'd like to know what you think. So, you know, flattery is everything. And you've, you've flattered them by, by saying, I want to know what you think. I want to I see what your take on it is. Now, you know, hopefully that doesn't backfire. But, but it's... It's a way to educate them. Maybe they're not reading the kinds of things you read. They're not aspire, you know, they're not seeing that aspiration at all. So it, it's starting to like sort of seed uh, their, their brains with the kind of thing you want to go after. Um, that's, it's a, again, I think it, it, it's, it can be a long process, right? It can be a long drawn out process. You get one success though, and it, it really can carry you. you. You know, you put in all the time yourself, you make that headway, you finally get that story. And the next time they're gonna, they're gonna listen a little quicker to your wild idea. And you should have those. Mariah. Mm. Hi, um, my name is Bert. I'm a J school student. And just on the topic of traumatic reporting, my thoughts went to climate change and Syria and just some things that like 
are not in the post yet? Like, how do you like document trauma that's still occurring? Or like any advice on that? How do you document trauma that hasn't been written about? Yeah. I mean, you have to go there. I, you know, that was a terrible CNN slogan at one point, <laughs> go there. But you, you have to go there. I mean, you, ha you have to be an eyewitness um, to that. That's my, that's my initial thought. I, I will say this, however, though. There are people who are witnessing it, right? There are often um, advocates working in, you know, in country, um, nonprofits, NGOs. You can report a lot through them. You have to be careful because they have an agenda. Um, it doesn't mean that what they say to you isn't valid and can't be reported, but you have to do it with that awareness that there's that they have, that they're trying to bring attention to it. They're not reporters. They're not um, trained, you know, eyewitnesses. Um, I'll tell a quick story. Um, CNN was doing a, a year, I think it went on for years actually, project on um, human trafficking. I mean, they called it the slavery project. But all the stories they were doing was, were human trafficking. And um, a young guy I worked with said to me, I wonder if there's a place where, we could, where, where the way we think of slavery pre-Civil War, if it still exists, where darker skinned people own, I'm sorry, lighter skinned people own darker skinned people. And he started digging around because he was he was just watching what we were doing and thinking like, OK, trafficking. But what about that? And so he found that the last country on Earth to outlaw human slavery is a place called Mauritania in West Africa. And Mauritania outlawed slavery, I want to say it's like 1984 or something. But you know what? They don't let journalists in their country and they're still people in slavery there. So the way he learned that was really by talking to people who were working in that country uh, with those people, um, abolitionists, um, nonprofits, and also eventually was able to speak to escaped slaves. And so, you know, he got enough momentum on, the, on that story by on the telephone, frankly. Um, to the point where we, um, we made an application to get a visa to go to Mauritania. Because to write about it based on what others say would be one level of story, but to witness for yourself, which these people said we would, um, people in slavery w would be a, another, another thing altogether, right? And we felt like we had to do that. And, you know, would we have maybe written something if we didn't get in? Maybe, maybe not. Um, but he got in there, and um, I told this story. He actually um, took nine months to get approval to get into the country. We discovered that if we said our purpose was to write about slavery, we would never get in. We said our purpose was to write about, um, what's it called, the word, um, locusts. They, ha they had locust problems in their country. So we said, we want to come and write about the locust problem. And we did. Okay, so that's the way we threaded the needle. We said we're going to write about locusts. We showed up. It was the first story we did. We wrote about the locust problem. And then we began to, um, he began to meet with um, freed um, escaped slaves and people helping the, the slaves escape in the dark of night. They had put a government minder on him. They went with him everywhere, he and a videographer. So to escape that guy, they had to do stuff in the middle of the night. Um, change cars, 
go several places before they finally met up. And then um, they would drive into the desert, and these slave villages were out in the desert. So these people were not chained, but they were enslaved in their minds. And they were in these villages out in the desert. The government car, they'd let the government car get like way far ahead of them. And they'd pull over, jump out, interview people, photograph, videotape. And that was how they were able to get that story. So that's a long uh, example. But I, I think that it can be done, you know, and it can be done at different levels. Like, you, we definitely could have reported on that story without going there. But because of the nature of it, um, it seemed important to see it for ourselves. Oh, Mariah. Hi, I'm Mariah Thomas. I'm a student in the journalism school. Um, so I think one thing we learn about a lot in journalism school is obviously that objectivity is important in our reporting. But I feel like with victims of trauma and with being humans who experience empathy, it's hard to maintain that objectivity when we're reporting on these events. And I guess I'm wondering if you can comment at all on the lines between objectivity and empathy and where those begin and end. Hmm. Wow, really good, really good question. Um, I think you can be empathetic and be objective. Um, I think you can be objective and be empathetic. I don't see them as canceling each other out. Um, obviously, when you're reporting on victims, the corroboration of a story is every bit as vital and important as if you were reporting on anything else. And we've seen that, right, with all these... Um, screwed up stories that have, that have come out in the last few years, um, particularly on rape. Um, and so you have, to, um, you have to set aside, at some point, the empathetic part of you, which is doing what? It's, it's helping you listen. It's helping you try to... Um, portray what it would be like to be in someone's shoes. But at some point, that's no longer the most important thing for you to do. The more important thing is for you to report it all around the victim, um, to corroborate a story. And, and of course, you know, we've, <laughs> it's messy because we've all heard, um, you know, that sometimes rape victims are not believed, that they're, they're questioned in ways that indicate um, that their stories are not believed, they're suspect. And, and I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about um, kind of assaulting a victim over, you know, detail. Um, but, but taking that story and then checking it out, you know, every way. I don't, you guys are young, but, but us old journalists had a saying that was... Um, I'm not going to get it right. Uh, what's the saying? If your, mother, if your mother says she loves you, check it out. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm so old I couldn't even remember the, the old journalist saying. Um, yeah, so I, I think that's a partial answer at least. Um, and then again, if it doesn't check out, then you are back to that, to that survivor or that victim. And, and now you do have to go, you know, to those places. Jason. Jan, yes. I've worked with you for a few weeks now. And um, <laughs> thank you, first of all, for being here. I have a question for you, kind of personal. You've been in this business for a long time. And... I'm really curious, where do you draw your strength from to have not become jaded? Like, how have you not thrown up your hands in the air and just said, I'm done with this? Because you seem grounded, solid. Tell us, please, your secret. Got you, fool. Uh, yeah. Um, 
I just really believe in the work. You know, I think it's important work. I mean, I, I mean, I would also say I am sort of a Pollyanna. Like I've been accused of that, of like always seeing, you know, the bright side or the glass full. Um, but mostly, I I take it from the work itself, and not from the reaction to the work so much. I mean, yeah, it's great. You get some guy out of prison who wasn't guilty, but those are going to be far and few between. And, and I never look to my bosses for that, for the, for the approval. Um, because, you know, you have some great bosses, and maybe you'll get it, and sometimes you won't. It has to come from the work. Um, you believe in what you're doing. I mean, we've talked about this in class. When you're doing a really difficult interview with someone and they're emotional, you know, how do you get through that as the journalist? And um, Jason interviewed a very smart journalist who said that she feels that it's her job just to hold that space there for them. It's not about her. And she can contain it all by reminding herself I'm here for this person, and I'm holding this space for them. They can talk. They can cry. They can do whatever they want to do. Um, but I think the same is true just for just about anything. You, you, if you believe in what you're doing, I don't, I, I don't think you'll get jaded. Um, you'll have disappointments, you know, buku, lots of those. Um, about the best I can do. Hey, Jan. My name is Zoe. I'm a reporter um, at the Missoula newspaper. I just wanted to go back to what you said about putting in your own time to work on larger projects and see if you had any advice for J students and younger reporters on how to kind of balance that with making sure that you're being compensated for your time and that you're avoiding um, burnout, just kind of in general, I mean, when you're reporting on trauma, it's obviously very like taxing emotionally. So I just would love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. you you're sort of calling me on it, uh, and that's good. <laughs> um, yeah, it's important to take care of yourself, right? Um, it is important to, um, to be compensated for the work you do. And I think the, the dilemma comes when your job is spelled out and defined the way it is by a boss. And honestly, you either accept that and you, that's what you do, or you try to find the inroads to show that boss that there's more that you could do. And you know, my, my thought about that is, it's, it's just like any story you propose on the job they say you have. You do research on it, you look into it, and then you're like, okay, here's what the story is. And I'm sort of saying, if you have a passion project, you, you have to do that. You have to do the, the reporting um, to even make the pitch. And you know, maybe personally you draw the line where you do the reporting and you make the pitch, and if they say it's a go, then you're good. And maybe your line is, if they don't, even after I've shown this pitch and done this reporting, they're not going to go for it, maybe you're not going to do it. You have, every individual has a kind of a, a limit there. And um, just to touch on the part about you know reporting on trauma being difficult, yeah, it's... We've been a little slow, slow in our profession to sort of recognize that, that, that a lot of journalists are first responders. And you know, there's long been a, a kind of macho culture in, in journalism where you just like deal with it. Um, it's being talked about a lot more now, a lot, lot more. Like there's a, I know there's a Facebook group called Journalists Covering Trauma. I think that's okay for journalists to talk to each other about what they're going through um, and offering support or getting actual resources. I confess I'm not very big on journalists talking to the public 
about our difficulty in covering trauma because I think we're not the story. You know, and it, it, when we talk too much about how hard it is for us, again, like I think we can do that in our, within our tribe, right, our group, but we do that with the public. I, I just, I think it's, um, I think it puts the balance in the wrong place and it undercuts a little bit um, our credibility. Um, that's just a personal opinion. Carol, we have one more over here if we have time. One last question right here. Hi, Jan. Uh, it's Ella Musgrove. Uh, I work at the Montana Kaiman, but I'm also a student at the J School. I have uh, two, I think, easy questions. Um, but what do you say to those who wish not to write or even see kind of like deep news stories on this topic or just want to see surface level discussions about hard things going on in the world? I'm not sure I heard it all completely. What, what do we say to people who don't want the deep story and want yeah. the surface level? Mm -hmm. Those people being readers or writers or readers anybody okay. in the world who or editors whatever. news yeah um there's a lot of places to get the surface material right there's a lot of places to just get the skim of whatever's happening and so what i say to those people is like everybody's got that you know i i want to go somewhere else with that story that'll be surprising, um, that might be eye-opening, might, might spur somebody to action. So I, I think it helps to acknowledge, um, especially if you were speaking to an editor, like people can get that surface story 2,000 places, right? Um, so again, even that conversation is an education for, for an editor. For people who don't want to go there, they don't have to. They can read, you know, BuzzFeed all they want. <laughs> Whatever. Um, Fill in the blank. CNN. And then uh, my second question, how far or like how deep is too deep mm -hmm. for a story about trauma? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, I mean, um, that's been a huge part of our discussion in our class. Um, the first thing about trauma reporting is do no harm. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, we see people go into a situation and question someone when it's too fresh. And um, I've asked people to do it when it's too fresh. I I've done that. It takes... Um, experience a little bit to learn um, when you're stepping over that boundary. And, but I would really urge all of you who are reporters, you have more power than you know. Um, you know, it's weird, like the newsroom equation always feels like it's the people who are editors and managers who have the power, but they don't. You do, because you're the ones going out there on the front line. And so, I've said in my class, I will listen to someone who says to me, um, I don't want to go out there and question that person now. I think it's too soon, but I'll go and I'll see. Okay, so, so better, better to say, not like, I don't want to do it, it's too soon, but to say, I have this feeling about this, but I will go and I will see. And what you might do is you go to that scene and you read the scene and you say to yourself, no, it's, I'm not going to go up to that woman whose baby just died in this flood. But I am going to go up to her and introduce myself and give her my card. And then you wait. Um, it's, it's do no harm. And then second is get it right. If you do it, get it right. Um, there was a study um, we've been reading about in one of the textbooks we're reading where they did a study. They talked to a lot of people who were the subjects of trauma stories. 
And the vast majority of them, their complaint was about accuracy. You know, this is a story of your life getting told out there and just getting something wrong. Um, I want to I want to tell a story just real quickly too that um, Kevin von Valkenburg told in his Polner speech because I watched and what he told was the story of being assigned to cover um, the suicide of a young woman and just just thinking no way there's no way I'm going to I want to do this. Um, even considered maybe just lying to the editor and saying, oh, she didn't want to talk, the mom didn't want to talk. But what will always stick with me is Kevin, Kevin told that story. And when that woman read that story, she said, thank you, I don't have to explain my daughter anymore. I don't have to explain to people that she had an illness and we tried our darndest. And this is what happened. The story became her passage back into her community, right? Because she, was, she wasn't part of it anymore. This, this horrible event had just like, you know, cut her off from everybody. People probably walked around on eggshells around her. And this story reconnected her. Um, so, so that's... I guess, I don't even remember what your question was, Ella. But I think that's the importance of, of the work you're doing. It's not always cathartic for someone. No, don't assume that. But don't assume that people don't want to talk. I'm going to tell one more story, and then I'll shut up. Another, another story that my mother told me, OK? My mother was a small town banker, little town outside Kansas City. And probably about 20 years after my brother died, I was home visiting. And she said to me, uh, I said, oh, I can't believe how much this town has grown. It just like boomed. It got eaten up by Kansas City. It was just huge. And she says, yeah, you know who my favorite customers are? And I said, no. She said, the customers who know I raised three kids, not two. She said, I love those people. They come in, and sometimes they'll say, I remember when your son Jim did X, Y, Z. And that told me that very often people have one chance to talk about their loved one, their loss. They have that chance. And so don't assume that they don't want to talk to you. They may not get to talk about that person much ever again. Okay. I want to thank Jan for a thoughtful lecture, and I especially want to thank all of you for coming out tonight.